Gosh, this is so exciting. That's such great music. <laughs> so hello, everyone. Welcome. I think that we're going to get started. We have a really amazing event today. My name is Elizabeth Waterman, and I'm a photographer. And today is the closing celebration of the exhibition Gorgeous Drag um, that is currently being shown at Album and Gallery. And it is also an event that is really in conjunction with Interpride, which is an amazing organization and a champion of drag queens. And today is gonna to be a really rich, amazing conversation about drag and culture. And it is also going to be a great visual presentation of the work in the show. And it's gonna be great on a lot of levels. So welcome for those of you who are here from all around the world, different fans of drag and photography and Interpride and all of that. We're thrilled that you're here and I have some amazing players here today who are gonna join in the conversation. So welcome. Um, I also wanna let everyone know that a percentage of sales from all the work that is in the exhibition that's sold today and in the next seven days we'll be going to Interpride. Um, we're really, you know, supporting the organization. And today during the event, and of course anytime, but especially today, we're also fundraising and you can contribute to Interpride directly. So um, they're an amazing organization. You're gonna learn about them today and there'll be information in the chat. You can actually text to donate to Interpride. So, with that being said, I have some amazing players and a little bit of how today is going to go is in the next hour, you're going to get a chance to see the work in the exhibition. And I'm going to chat with the gallery director, who Stefan, who put the work together. And then I'm going to introduce some amazing players, Interpride, um, and we're going to talk about drag and culture. And there will be a chance for audience Q&A. So with that... I'm going to bring up Stefan, who's the gallery director and founder of Album and Gallery. And he's here. He's, he's coming in from London, which is amazing. So we have the UK representative. And we're going to look, Stefan and I are going to start off by looking at some of the work in the show. How are you so, doing? Yeah. And we have a lot of people here. I'm going to introduce all these people throughout the hour, and it's really awesome. But if we could um, pull up the images in the actual show, and we're going to go through them. Well, first great. of all, good evening, good morning, good okay. midday, good afternoon to everybody who's uh, joining us. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, I met um, Elizabeth, um, I think we met um, just over a year ago. Uh, and um, uh, we started talking about your work and, and I um, was looking at stuff and was getting quite interested. And, and I was getting particularly interested when you showed me uh, work, um, which ultimately resulted in the Gorgeous Drag exhibition, work you'd done in the years uh, 2014 to 16 in New York, uh, documenting and portraying the, the drag scene, a buoyant drag scene, but at a very, very sort of um, interesting point in time. And, and what I took away from looking at that work and talking to you, and which really was a, a big sort of driver for me to say, we'll do that exhibition together, is it's the, your, the work you did then um, really marks uh, not just one departure, but two departures, uh, which I think was really interesting and fascinating. On the one hand, you sort of stepped into the still slightly dingy backroom bars uh, in, in 
Brooklyn, uh, Bushwick, um, you were accepted, I uh, understand, um, by the community there. Uh, but it was a time, uh, just a time when, when that, when that, you know, uh, backroom drag scene was sort of getting a little bit more assertive and breaking out. And and before long, you know, um, fast forward, um, the drag scene was sort of big festivals creating quite famous drag artists but you were there at that point when it was moving from the shadowy back bars into the open but at the same time and I thought that was a you know really interesting sort of aspect of it I sort of could see that going through your work and talking to you about your work it really also marked the quite a significant departure in your own work and in your photographic career uh, because you know prior to that you'd, um, you'd you'd had a studio in 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 New York and you were doing fantastic but you know fairly conventional commercial uh, portrait photography so quite a departure moving into that world and I I uh, uh, thinking about what that meant you for you as an artist and the work you're doing I thought there was a really fascinating journey and that really grabbed me and captivated me so my 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 you know i i i, I always thought and I, I put that question before when we met you know how, what was that sort of swift journey from the tiny studio into the back room into the back box? what was that like for you you know as you're talking it really has me present to what i what the drag queens provided for me and the creativity of that scene. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the work, and there might be some of you, I took, you know, candid photos of then kind of unknown drag queens in Bushwick and Manhattan, 2014, 2015, 2016. And these are some drag queens, some of which became very big stars. You know, we have Aquaria and Sasha Velour and Scarlet Envy and Amber Alert, Amber Alert and some of these people are very big, as you probably know. But you know, when I, I I had been kind of stuck in the studio shooting, and and then I went out to these drag bars. My wonderful studio manager at the time, Amber Alert, you know, he also was Amber Alert, uh, told me about these shows, and I was I went to these places, and I saw these amazing drag queens, and they were so free and self-expressed and hilarious. And they did these performances that were so manicured and amazing. And it inspired me to shoot more freely and more spontaneously. And I started working with little disposable film cameras that I literally kept kind of tucked in my bra, you know, and I would pop out and take pictures and the drag queens never once did not want their photo taken. And they were so encouraging and it was really the ushering me into a new type of photography and, and they, 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 yeah. they, they they there were no sort of hurdles or thresholds uh, being accepted i mean was that was that quite easy or did it take a bit to be accepted in that community you know i think that for me at least drag queens really were so inclusive and they are all about accepting people into their community and so it was a very welcoming community and it was a, also a crowd of artists. You know, this was Bushwick in, you know, five, six, seven years ago. And it was a burgeoning scene. It was not, it was kind of rough around the edges. And everyone there was creating art. And drag queens are artists, you know, first and foremost in my mind. And creating their image and their performance and their whole, the whole experience. So they were really welcoming. And, you know, I'll never forget there's you know, obviously many of you know Aquaria, probably all of you. And there was a shot, I think it's the one we're looking at now. And we were in the back of some Holy Mountain Lady Fag event, right? There's a mouthful. And she popped around the corner and I saw her and I flashed her with the flash and took a picture. And I caught her a little off guard. You know, she had the grace and the presence. You can tell she was gonna become a star. and. She just smiled at me and she was great with me, 
you know, I caught her off guard for a second and then she just, she remembered me and she saw who I was. Cause I was always at these events. So these people kind of knew me. Um, and that was just such a wonderful moment there with Aquaria in this dingy <laughs> club. <laughs> but she made a real effort to, to be there for me and to pose and to be great and fabulous with everybody. It's, it's, it's interesting, you, you, you're just sort of touching on, you know, you and the people, you know, the drag artists you were, you were taking photos of, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, I, I said that, you know, I thought it was a, it's really an interesting aspect, you as a, as a photographer artist, moving from the studio into, out, out of the studio into that scene, but there's something else that goes with that, and that is, you know, when you, when you're a portrait photographer in the studio, there are very clearly defined roles, you know. You're the photographer, you're controlling the scene, you know. Um, obviously the subject is, is complying, you know, but you're, you're calling, as it were, the shots, you know. And those sort of, almost sort of hierarchical dynamics, you know, they're sort of blown out of the water when you go into a, a, a into a bar where with with drag queens performing. You know what was that like? Oh my gosh, it was so liberating. You know, it was so refreshing because my my photography. What really shifted with the work that you're looking at right now was the photography became more of a dance. It was a dance between me and these creative drag queens. And it was spontaneous and it was exciting. And they knew I was taking pictures, but they were also doing their own thing. And I would catch a moment sometimes where they were aware of me, sometimes they weren't. And I was kind of grabbing moments out of time and it became much more spontaneous and exciting. So it was, you know, there was just such a creative surge of energy coming from the community of drag queens in New York at that time. And it inspired me to become way more creative with my work. And it was such a breath of fresh air coming out of the studio and these kind of very, you know, staid portraits. And, and, and the way you're talking about the kind of sort of by implication, you know, provide answers to some of the, the, the questions I, I had for you. And that is, um, um, uh, you know, there's this sort of sense of community, which I think comes out very strongly in in those in those uh, pictures in those photos and a, co a community that included you and you, you as a photographer have been part of that community and, and that's something that i that really grabbed me you know and uh, looking at those photos because it's very much part of you know there's nothing there's you know i mean in in a wider sort of context you we were talking about the the the, the world of uh, gender roles and gender identities. We're talking, you know, on the periphery to some extent about sexuality and sexual aspects, you know, and all those things can and have been, you know, in terms of photography portrayed uh, in a very patronizing and, and appropriating sensational way. And what, what grabbed me about your uh, uh, images was that none of it there, there is a that there's a very humane sort of tenor there, you know, it's very humanistic, you know, and I think that's very important, um, uh, a, a very important uh, aspect of your work, you know. Um, so, yeah, so um, um, the other thing that goes with it, and, 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 and maybe you can comment on that is, you know, there's, you know, through, you know, shot through all of that, you know, an enormous sense of uh, self-deprecating irony and, and, and humor, you know, that's part of that world, isn't it? Yeah. Oh my gosh. The, the kind of campiness and the caricaturizing and the satire of drag queens, <laughs> you know, they definitely did not take themselves too seriously. And that was also incredibly refreshing for me because I am, I don't know if any of you can relate. I take myself way too seriously most of the time. And so, <laughs> It doesn't come across. <laughs> Being in this community of performers, you know, they their costumes were nuts and their performances were nuts. You know, um, I'll never forget some of those moments that these yeah. with these they were very polished and you know amazing. 
And there was just this real sense of irony and silliness. I love that yeah. one. That is one of my favorites in terms of, you know, yeah. you know, community self-deprecating sense of humor and irony. I love that picture, you know, amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you really provided that space for everyone around them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's two, uh, one other thing, you know, there's, there's kind of, with that, with, with that body of work, you know, there are, they're looking at it from a sort of, you know, we're talking about photography, etc. It's got two aspects to it, you know, there's a, there's a reportage aspect to it, you know, and there's a, you know, creative artistic aspect to it, you know, how, how, how do those two sort of things play with each other in, in your mind, in your work, you know, through your lens? That's a, another really great question. Um, I'll answer that and then I want to kind of open up the space as well to some more conversations. Um, but I think a lot of the work is very tightly edited. So I have a very particular style and kind of vision and I was able to kind of bring that in a lot in the editing and the post and choosing the photos that I chose. It kind of created a particular look and kind of real artistic kind of fine art elevated experience with the work. Um, and, you know, I was the only one at these events that was shooting on film, that was shooting with disposable film cameras, that was kind of catching moments off guard. I would hold the camera away from my face. I would just hold it up in the air, you know, so I was kind of working through the space in a different way. And it gives the body of work a real distinct look, which I'm really proud of. It's one of the bodies where I love this body of work, and I'm so glad, Stefan, that you have really been the champion of it and bringing it to the public and sharing these moments of these queens before they were anybody. And it was such a powerful time. So, you know, I know that I am- We'll take it to other places. Yes, yes. Well, the exciting thing, and I am so glad everyone you're here today and the shape of today's conversation is really kind of the first of more to come. And I know that so there were, you know, we have talent, that are, you know, we have Juanita Moore, who she was gonna be here today, but she had, she's not gonna be here today. And part of why is because we all wanted to create the context of the work and drag queens and what they provide for society and culture and people personally. We wanted to kind of start into that inquiry before we brought the, the talent in. And so be aware that this is the first of many conversations and there will be more episodes coming and we will have talent. But to kind of kick it off, I wanted to introduce Madonna, who's the global project manager of fun development and partnerships of Interpride. And, you know, Madonna, I would love to hear about your organization. And I know that again, people, if they want to donate directly, there's a code in the chat, people can donate, but do you want to tell us about not only Interpride, but also kind of in this theme of drag queens and how they've impacted you and, and your organization. Thank you, Elizabeth. First, I'd like to thank you for bringing this to us, for including us. I, you know, I'm a fan of your work. I, I just think it's brilliant. And to my friend, Laura, for, for bringing us together. I'm very grateful. I know the organization is grateful. I wanted to first talk about drag queens and their influence on me. Um, because as people, as folks were talking, I was thinking when I came out in the 70s in Texas, in Dallas, Texas, we were going to bars and, you know, I was a young baby dyke and I was just like out there putting myself out there, but I could also walk out on the street and be completely, you know, normal in people, in, you know, Texans eyes. So, um, but the drag queens were out and bold and, and providing some safe space for us. Like I felt, I always felt nurtured and loved and, and not judged and just, I could be who I was because they were just being who they, they are and were. And it, it, it transcends throughout, it's timeless. You know, um, I just went to Best in Drag show last month here in LA and I, I've never, I just, it was brilliant and, um, I, I just wanted to put that out there because I feel like the the images you capture here, uh, your photography captures that 
vibe that you get when you're around the Queens up to the point where when I was the executive director of LA Pride a couple of years ago or in 2019 we had an event and Lucy and Ethel and drag walked in and I was just like oh my god I, I love them so much you know so uh thank you for bringing this forward because they're they've been in the movement since day one I work for Interpride um I found out about Interpride when I was the executive director of LA Pride. It's a member organization, a global member organization. We have over 300 members in over 65 countries. We do all kinds of work. Uh, we help support folks around the globe who may you know, may have lost funding. And I'm going to have my friend Alan talk about that. But uh, we, have, we provide humanitarian funding, scholarship funding, to folks around the globe, networking. We are also the licensor of the World Pride brand, which will be in Sydney, Australia in, 20, in February, 2023. Um, so it's an amazing, amazing organization. And I'm very proud to work with them um, as part of this team. Uh, we're here today because, you know, obviously we're, we, the, our work goes hand in hand and uh, I would work with Elizabeth for the rest of my life because I just think you're phenomenal. And I feel like, you know, being in a place to raise uh, funds today too, our coffers are a little dry because we did have to, we have, you know, member organizations all over the world, including in Ukraine and other areas, uh, in some hostile areas where, you can, you're not allowed to be yourself at all. So uh, you're not allowed to be your authentic self to a point where you could be murdered for being who you are. So we're, we're, uh, we're in the process of raising more money because our good uh, board and committee chairs have, you know, pretty much funded uh, folks around the globe. So without, uh, you know, taking Alan's thunder, I just want to say that uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about our work. It's a great story. we got great stories to tell about the work. And um, we've done everything from help, helping major pride organizers to, you know, folks in Kenya have a meal together. I mean, it's, um, it's quite a, a touching uh, body of work that the organization has. That's so awesome. It's Thank you for sharing about what you're doing and the important work that you're doing and also the the inspiration of drag queens and what they what they provided for you when you were younger i love it the baby dyke madonna like uh, the image in my head is great so. <laughs> i did have a mullet in case you were wondering oh so. <laughs> That's the picture that we need like forget about this oh. we need a picture of madonna no, <laughs> next time next time there's next a time. Right there. get my mullet picture yes yes um, so we also have Alan Rife, I hope I'm saying your last name right, coming in from Queens, New York at the moment, and he is the board secretary and co-chair of the Solidarity Fund for Interpride, so big role in Interpride, and he is the co-chair of the fund that today's direct donations to Interpride and the percentage of the print sales from the exhibition will be going to, so he can tell us a little bit about that, and I think Alan can also speak to drag queens and the impact that they've had on his life and in the organization. So no, uh, absolutely. Thank, you, thank you all so much for letting me be a part of this. Uh, as we've been expressing, drag art is very important to a lot of people. For me, growing up in New York City, it's an integral part of who I am and my whole community. But the past couple of years, it has had an amazing impact on me as a person. I was the primary caregiver for my mother for the past five years. And last year she died at 101 years of age. Um, no tears, it's an amazing life she had. And uh, she used to love to go to drag performances with me because she was a dancer, a hoochie coochie dancer in her early days. So for me, I would not have been able to get through the experience of caring for an elderly parent. And even this past year, which is, yesterday was the first anniversary of her death, Without my friends in the drag community, the, the assassins who perform, Angela Mansbury, suddenly see more people in the New York City community who are my breath of life that I would not have been able to find joy and continue life or see myself in a different way through them. So drag has a healing element to it that maybe not everybody is aware of that 
personally, that's how it's helped me. So it's a very important part of my life. And to be here today kind of validates that. But on to the more important issue of the Enterprise Solidarity and Humanitarian Funds. These particular funds, in addition to our scholarship fund, is our direct link to our community by giving back money. So the money that we raise goes right back to the community. The Solidarity Fund is, is set up to give grants to organizations in the global South and East that are in hostile environments and don't have access to funding before. We've given grants to the Ukraine to help Kiev Pride and Krakow Pride, Uganda, Kenda, the Congo, Nigeria, Tunisia. We have a grant waiting to go out to Nepal, Thailand, China, El Salvador, Hungary, India. I mean, I could go on. So the point is that we're touching everywhere. Everybody who comes in, the committee evaluates, and we try to fund as many organizations as we can, from small gatherings to doing educational events to some organizations, $1,000 prides their whole programming for the year. In addition to humanitarian aid, which is emergency funds that go out, um, in Uganda, we gave money to a safe house for them to feed people and make sure that they were safe. Money goes out. We've given money out for black prides within the United States that are still in 2022, don't have the same access to funding. Um, India, an organization for the Hidara, which is um, transsexual, um, female, female, male to female people living. I mean, it's amazing the work that we do. So any money that comes in really goes to support this. It's all community funded. It's You can see where the money goes on our website and for the entire board, for the membership and on a very personal level, it's very gratifying to do this. And we really appreciate your donations. Amazing. Do you, can you speak any more to drag queens and what they provide or represent for the community that you represent? Well, as far as Interpride goes, Interpride's been around for 40 years and in the early days of our general conferences and the memberships, it's really made up of the member pride organizations. If it wasn't for the drag community, we wouldn't have any entertainment. We wouldn't have anything to bring people to our pride events. So there's a very, very healthy historical link between pride organizations and into pride in the drag community. Um, we support drag performers in hostile environments. And if you think about it, pride organizers, our primary goal is to create safe spaces. So as a drag performer in the early days, when you're doing your thing and you're out there, how much more out could you be? You're making your own safe spaces. So to me, it's an evident link how pride organizations have always and should continue to support our drag performers and the drag community. So, uh, I'm glad that we have a similar sentiment of celebration of drag queens. Now, we, I wanna circle back, Alan, but I also wanna introduce Ryan from Interpride. And speaking of someone who really loves drag queens and can speak to how they've, they've touched him and, and the work that you're doing, and Ryan is the chief technology officer of Enterprise. And he's also the, the one who's making this whole presentation kind of come together for us. So I really want to thank you, Ryan, for doing that. And I want to invite you to share as well from just what drag, what do drag queens provide you? And if you have any sentiments about what they provide culture in general, I want to kind of open it up further to that as well. Thank you so much for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And I, I wish I was this chief technology officer. I'm actually the communications and technology a global project manager. Sometimes it, it feels like a CTO position now. Uh, so Elizabeth, I want to first just thank you so much for hosting this, you know, important discussion. Uh, obviously, the pictures that you've taken are just every single one of them tells such a powerful story. And there's just so much love and so much vibrancy and, and just so much excitement in each of them. And I just I, I can't say how much drag really has had an impact on my life. It's I remember my first drag performance was when I was 18 years old. This is obviously some years ago. Uh, and it was Tara Nicole. I'll never forget her. Tara Nicole was the first drag queen I ever saw in a bar called Mickey Rats that no longer exists. And I remember that was the very first time I'd ever seen a drag queen in my entire life. And I, 
I remember saying, wow, that is so cool that men can dress up like women and look like women. You know, at the time, I, I didn't have any understanding of the true artistic talents that go into it. And over time, I, I drew an infatuation for the performances, for the work. And, you know, most drag queens, uh, I'd say 99% of them are always trying to find a way to give back to the local community. Mm -hmm. You know, and here in Phoenix, we find that our drag queens are just amazing. They raise money for the local Phoenix Pride Scholarship Fund because I'm on board of directors with them. And then for other causes like One in Ten, which is which helps uh, underserved youth, LGBTQ youth. I mean, whatever it is, you you bring a bunch of drag queens together. That's the best way to fundraise for anything because they know how to move the crowd, how to get you excited, how to give you a damn good bit of entertainment, and to really embrace the fact that this is a place when there's a drag performance going on, this is a safe space. This is a safe place. This is where I feel I can be my most authentic self because of the creativity, because of the energy, and because of the love that surrounds it. So drag for me has really made an incredible impact on my you know, perspective of what it means to be in the LGBTQIA plus community. And I, I'm so excited to be part of this panel today. And Elizabeth, I, again, I love your work and I look forward to us continuing these important discussions. Yeah, it's, it's a rich conversation. Um, and thanks, Ryan. You know, it's just, I'm present to that, you know, drag queens, what caught my attention so much when I was there with my camera in these, you know, dingy bars in New York is they're such icons and they're so kind of unbelievable. They're larger than life. You know, they're perfect makeup and they have a whole look curated that's different from time to time. I mean, you'll see in the images that are cycling through, there's like three or four pictures of Aquaria and she looks totally different every time. So, you know, the drag queens, they would go to events and they would spend so much time putting their appearance together. And in many times it was, you know, kind of a commentary on culture or it was a satire, it was, you know, kind of a caricature of a female trope. And I mean, it was such a attention getter. You know, I mean, you can't help but stop and pause and start to question, you know, a lot of things when a drag queen is there because they are a beacon of self-expression and they are this kind of gender mixer, you know? And so it's, they are such a fun, important symbol for society. So, you know, I, speaking of how drag queens really make an impact in culture and how that's important and how they make a social difference, I know, that, uh, Alan, I wanted to invite you to share kind of a moment that you can recall when you really saw that exemplified. Oh my goodness. Well, you know, we all, we all know there's been atrocities in the LGBT community even when Ryan White passed away. And there are other stories, you know, we all know the story about people being strung up on fences. It's horrible. I was at a rally in Manhattan and this was a lot, at least 30 years ago. And the audience and the crowd was crazy. And the organizers spontaneously asked the drag performers in the audience to help. They needed help to organize the crowd, which goes to the point where you just said, um, larger than life and they're easily seen and they take up the space and a massive amount of drag queens in the audience started organizing the crowd keeping them in corrals they had buckets to collect money they were asking for donations and the reason it worked was because you could see them they took their space they were not afraid to be seen and the rest of us wow. were just ordinary people and the drag queens were bigger than life. Yeah. Yet they use that not only for performance art, but to take control of a situation. And, and I think that's a credit to who they are and how they perform that when the light is on, they know how to control the space. And here they did it in an environment that wasn't really their forte, but they took control of the moment. And it's very, very, strong in my mind, thousands of people in the street and who's organizing and who's putting people together, not the police, not the event organizers, but the local drag community. So moving. 
Yeah, I yeah, just want I mean, to they're so, it's so important for the community, you know. I mean, they really are kind of spokespeople in a way. Yeah, you're right. They, they are. I mean, drag queens really are leaders in the community. They really do drive us towards certain things, towards uh, activism. They, they really drive the activism. They get us excited about it. And so, Alan, you know, you're right. They, they are a part of our leadership structure in the community to help us get organized, get motivated and to be active, actually caring about certain issues. I, you know, it's inspiring to think about activism in the LGBT community and what it provides. And Madonna, I want to ask you a question. I kind of put you on the spot. So if you have an answer, but can you give us some examples of how activism just with Interpride, for example, in the last year or two has made a, like a real difference, like the results that it's produced. So you can share with us so we can see that what activism, you know, championed by drag queens or not can, what kind of difference it makes for people. Yeah, I mean, Interpride itself is an organization of, you know, as I mentioned, people from all over the world coming from completely different spaces, completely different uh, privilege. You know, we, I, I, as the executive director of LA Pride, I got to go on social media and talk about everything and, you know, just be out there with my pride. Whereas, you know, a pride in a hostile environment can't even talk about it. You know, they have to sort of find their spaces. So um, uh, I, what I love about, and what's also challenging is our membership comes from so many different places and spaces and, and, and are passionate activists, passionate. Uh, so that if you're in a meeting or you're in a, a workshop or anything, and they do not allow anything to slip by. Nobody gets to, nobody gets a pass. We've all been here a long time fighting for our rights, fighting for the right to be authentic. And, and something I believe the drag queens, uh, you know, a drag artists brought to us early on, they, they were just out. And as Alan mentioned, I agree hundred percent leaders who were taking charge with humor and passion. And, and also it, some sadness, you know, I mean, they're just uh, very uh, influential in our movement. And I feel like they started, they, they allowed that to happen, you know, even back when I was coming out, but, you know, now um, uh, we all have come from these spaces. I came from, you know, the time when queer was a terrible word. Uh, you were called a queer because it was, you would be, it was derogatory toward you or, um, and uh, I came from my brother dying of AIDS in New York City. So I have this sort of history, my history of being a lesbian in the community and, and coming up through, you know, the movement. And so, but my history is different from Alan's history or Ryan's history or the indigenous community's history or BIPOC folks community where we're all, we all come in these, you know, spaces together and try to find common ground and try to find how to get through something that's very difficult for us because what may have impacted me one way will impact my sibling in another way. And so, and that might conflict. So we have to find out, I feel like Enterprise is one of those organizations that if those, con when those conflicts arise, not if, but when they arise, that people, every single person is there because they want to be, because they want to be uh, beacons of light and change and, and authenticity. So I see when these people come together in a room that yes, we may have to duke it out for something, but we there's nothing that is left unsaid or nothing that is left at least with some form of, of a next step or a, a next step toward a resolution or how do we do this better, you know? And I think that's just a that's just in, uh, been something that our communities dealt with since the beginning. But we haven't had these forums in which to discuss these things or really be honest with each other about how we feel about certain things. So, um, yeah, I feel like Enterprise is sort of a beacon for that and and a unique organization because there isn't a global organization like ours where we actually are in these rooms with people from all over the world, pride organizers all over the world, speaking about issues, not only the issues that we might have together, but the issues they have at their own prides. 
you know, that when we come into a room and we discuss those things. Um, one of the things that when Stefan and I were looking for an organization that would really like to partner with um, to bring this work into the community, we love that you were worldwide. You know, it was really important and it was exciting. And, you know, this is one world. So um, uh, I want to, I'm going to just open the floor too. I know that we have people listening and participating and they're in your homes. You might have a question about drag queens and culture and enterprise and my work and my photography um, and album and gallery and the gorgeous drag exhibition, any one of those. I'm going to invite you to drop your questions in the chat and we may or may not, but hopefully we'll get a chance to answer them. So, uh, and I know that Stefan, who <laughs> I brought you in in the beginning and we were talking and then there's been all this other stuff going on, but I think you had something that you wanted to say. So I wanted to invite you to contribute to the dialogue. I think Stefan is muted, but Stefan is joining us from London and he's a curator of this show and this work. So he really went through my work and picked the 32 pictures in the exhibition um, and did such a great job. There's a lot of pictures. So <laughs> Stefan really did pick a nice selection. And I wanna remind everyone too, that if you, if you have a question, you can drop it in the chat and it can be a question about Interpride. It can be a question about my photography work and my photography practice and what it was like, you know, using a little film camera and these back bars with Aquaria before she was, you know, the Aquaria we know today. Um, or it could be a question to some of these thought leaders here about how drag has made a difference in culture and how they are these visual figureheads. So. Ah, I'm unmuted now. Yes, hello. I'm catching up with technology. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, <clears throat> it was so interesting to to listen to, you know, um, guys from Enterprise, et cetera. And, and, you know, against the background of what we were talking about before and, and here we are in 2022. I would like to ask the sort of the, the the members of the panel how much has been achieved. What are the you know the, the, the next frontiers? You know, and and uh, you know what, what's still. I mean, in terms of wider society, in Western countries, and Christ, of course, in in non-Western countries where it's not that easy sometimes, you know, um, what needs, I mean, do, do, do you guys feel this is progressing in terms of society accepting uh, gender diversity, et cetera, or is there still a heck of a lot more to be done? Great question. I think anyone from Enterprise can comment on that. Well, I think there's, uh, I think it's certainly it's uh, influential, but there's a lot more to be done. I mean, there, there's, um, I think some of our activists who aren't, in, you know, drag artists who just are authentically themselves and who, you know, a gender identity, like uh, pronoun, what are your pronouns? Like if I, talking to people about who they are authentically is where we start making more progress. That's something that the organization does as well. We do workshops and uh, like even corporate employee workshops on those uh, topics. But Alan, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about that as well. Uh, well, I mean, in, as far as drag and doing pride work, um, drag performers kind of push the envelope to make sure that we're aware that things are not equal. I mean, I live in New York City and everybody thinks New York City, you know, is the place, the end all and the be all. But it's it's like any place else. There are still battles to be fought. You're constantly hearing about people in restaurants who are perceived to be one way or another. And there's always a, there's possibly having a fight. Last night I was on the subway and there were these beautiful, vibrant young people dressed in in drag they were going to a party. I overheard them. They were not. Um, they were not 
trans because they were certainly drag performers talking about, oh, girl, they were doing this whole thing like they were going to a show that was specifically dressed up to do drag. And they were so proud of it. And someone on the subway yelled some horrific derogatory word at them. And, and the drag performer who was going to work or something turned around with their purse and went like, poof, turned to shit. You know what I mean? So, I mean, my God, they, they're grasping and controlling. I, I, don't, I don't think any of us are free. Until all of us are free, none of us are free. You know, LGBTQIA+, we keep adding letters to the alphabet because more people need the right for self-identification. And the way the politics is moving across the world with the, you know, Le Pen in France and look what just happened in Italy and God knows what's happening in the United States political scene. If we don't have the drag community out there pushing the envelope, envelope for the rest of us to ride that wave, to fight, I mean, you know, you, you see me, you, you see cis white old gay man, but you see a drag performer and you're like, wow, glitz and glamor and sequins and boom, you, you have something created. Exactly. Well, uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me ask, um, a, a, let me play devil's advocate here and ask a question. And that is over the last, you know, in the sake of the argument, how many decades, doesn't matter, you know, drag has become in some ways, you know, the drag culture, the drag entertainment culture has become a lot more acceptable to the extent that one, you know, fears in the context of this discussion, it's almost become of a sort of acceptable pantomime, you know, which um, which is distracting from the the true causes, if you wish. How do you feel about that? Can you say it? Questions. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm I, I need you to say it again and choose a di choose different vocabulary to say it. <laughs> Sorry, come again. Say it again, but try to say it with different words because I'm, no, I'm no, trying no, no, no. to. Okay, so what I'm saying is that in the last, um, I don't know, not just 20 years, even more so, you know, uh, in popular culture, television, film, theater, you know, the, the dra aspects of drag entertainment culture have become more acceptable, you know, to the extent, and this is my question, that when, you know, when it is seen in on television and, you know, wherever, you know, the sort of, you know, yeah, it's just entertainment, you know, and, and, and because it's become more acceptable, people don't actually see or forget about the real cause in terms of driving forward uh, acceptability of gender diversity in society. Okay, I can very briefly touch on that. For 30 years, I was a school teacher and um, the ch children who see drag performance because they're seeing someone who's living outside of the, the generally expected box of life, it gives them permission to be more unique and gives them an expression to be something more of who they are. But on the flip side, this is gasoline for the right to fuel everything that they see as wrong in society. So if you're a, a, an extreme liberal and someone who's working with children, as I do, this gives not only children, but people in society hope that there's the door is opening, the window is opening, you can be who you are. But then again, on the other side of the coin, it's just fuel for the fire for those to say, look at all these things that are making society wrong. Only time will tell. Well, I don't know if I'll be around to read the history books to see how this all ends, but it's very interesting times to live in. Yeah, indeed. You know, um, it's talking about how kind of drag queens are, are public and they're made public and they start to represent certain freedoms and also, you know, can even create themselves as kind of controversial. Um, you know, RuPaul and Drag Race, we have a question from the audience. So I want to allow that to get integrated. We have two, by the way, there are two stars in the gorgeous drag show, Aquaria and Sasha Velour, who did very well in RuPaul's Drag Race, as you may know. I think Aquaria won, 
and Sasha Velour was a contestant. So you'll see their photos as they're rotating on the screen. So RuPaul and Drag Race, here's the question. It's a great question. Brought drag into mainstream popular culture and people's daily lives. How do you think that in particular has affected society at large? Here's a specific example of where drag queens have been made very public and celebrated and on TV and, you know, RuPaul, how many seasons that show has gone through. What has, how has that affected society in particular? So I don't know if we have, we have fans in the, of the inner pride bunch for RuPaul's drag race, but you know, do you have any, anything to say on that? If you follow the show. It's a great show. It's awesome. Well, let me just first say it's that RuPaul art. just amazing. I love RuPaul. I remember the late nineties watching RuPaul before uh, she became a big thing and i was just so infatuated it made me uh, it made me so comfortable just knowing okay i'm not the only one out here in the world that's different there's other people out here that are different and it just you know i think rupaul opened up an entire mainstream of acceptance completely broke down barriers uh made a lot of christian conservatives start to reconsider their positions on things and each and every day because of drag and because of the influence on society, yeah, we have the radical right. And unfortunately, some of them have a bigger microphone than others. But then we have the mainstream society. We see every day people are starting to change their perceptions, their ideas, their, their belief system about who we are. And I believe drag has influenced that significantly. And I believe RuPaul has been the leader holding the torch in doing that. I think that, that a lot of people would agree with that certainly a very visible, accessible drag queen by a lot of people. You know, um, I, I want to, you know, it's, it, it's important to me as a photographer to make a difference with my work. And it's, you know, all these, when I was, all these pictures that you see, these drag queens just pose for me. I was in these venues, I was, you know, an artist in New York and they, contributed to me and they gave me their image and they gave me that moment with them. And I, a percentage of all sales of the prints from the album and gallery, gorgeous drag show will be going to inner pride. And it's important for me to contribute back to the community that gave me these pictures um, so freely. And it's, it's really ex an exciting, you know, thing. And you might want to know, you know, where you can see the full exhibition you might like to want to see these images again. So there'll be a link in the chat to the album and gallery website. And the exhibition, this is the closing event. So it's been up for a while, but the exhibition will, there's a permanent link that will be made available. And all um, sales for the next seven days will be, a percentage will be going to Enterprise. So um, if you're interested in a print, having some of this work, for sure, you know, you can get in touch with Stefan at album and gallery. Um, and there's also, I do want to just let you know that everyone can very easily do this. It's a chance to participate in a raffle that has been going on. And we will be drawing the winner of the raffle in a week or so. So it's this is your hot time to do it. But there is a book that contains these pictures from the show, a book that I have assembled of my work from 2011 to 2016. And there's also some images that you haven't seen before um, of drag queens and performers in New York. So there's a hundred limited edition copies of the book that are getting made in conjunction with the show. And we will be um, raffling off one of them. So there's a form you can fill out to enter the raffle. You can enter wherever you're in the world you are, you can enter the raffle and you can also stay in touch with me and my work that way. And maybe you'll get a book, a signed book on your doorstep. So, um, but there are also, you can purchase the book if you'd like and, um, the album and gallery website would be a good place to go to, to get all of that. So, you know, I know that there are a lot of you who are in the audience or who will be watching this, you know, this, this piece of material later, and you have undoubtedly been affected by drag queens and in some way, or you wouldn't be here. And so I hope that this conversation has served to kind of illuminate the difference that drag queens make in culture on a variety of levels and the difference that they make on a personal level for people. And as these really fabulous modern icons of gender fluidity and the LGBT movement, 
in so many ways. So um, did we have any kind of closing sentiments um, from our friends at, at Interpride? I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that Juanita is very sad she couldn't be here today. We're going to do another uh, panel with her. Um, but I have a little note, just a little note to read saying, we are very sorry to have to postpone Juanita's interview today. Although nothing serious, she is very under the weather and needs to rest. We will be, be back with you soon, better than ever. Loads of love. Team more, Juanita Moore. Uh, we wish her uh, that she gets well soon. We're sorry. We, we totally miss her, but we will definitely have her on next time that we are all together. For sure. She might have stolen the show completely. So yeah, we wouldn't have. We would have been so uninteresting. I've got, I've, got a, I've got a closing comment. <laughs> yes, but, please, Juan, yes. Keep up the good work, Elizabeth. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you. And I'm really. I'll let you know. Just give you a sneak peek. But I'm in the process right now. I'm living in Los Angeles right now, and I'm actually. I've been photographing transgender strippers. And amongst other people, I'm going to be going to Thailand, to Bangkok in January to photograph sex workers there. But um, there's some amazing transgender strippers I never knew. And I've been photographing them in Los Angeles. They messaged me on Instagram and I've been getting some amazing pictures. And who knows, it could be my next body of work. And so it, the, I continue to want to make a difference in, you know, the LGBT community. I would um, like to thank you for that, Elizabeth. Thank you very much for your generosity for giving back to the community for your art uh for your generous spirit i think you know if we all just sort of we're better to each other this way the world would be in a better place but we got to do keep doing the work so i just want to uh, send you a, a debt of gratitude from our board and staff and and our membership absolutely and obviously this is a rich kind of body of things to talk about so there will be another you know, gorgeous drag panel coming up before the end of the year. And we will, Juanita will definitely be a part of it and we may have other performers as well. So a good way to stay in touch with that would be to uh, enter the raffle. That would be a surefire way you'll be on my email list. And, you know, obviously if you're involved with Enterprise, you'll be, you'll be notified as well. So I wanna really, you know, I'm gonna bring the event to a close. I'm gonna start to bring it to a close here. But I want to thank you all for participating. And um, please also remember to consider, you can just donate directly to Interpride. So I'm going to put the code in the chat. And you can you can literally just text this code and donate any amount. Could be $5, could be $500, could be $5,000, whatever. It will make a difference with this organization that is really doing some great work. And then another preview of things to come is that um, Michelle Miao, who is an amazing radio show host, podcast host, she's involved with Enterprise. She will also be in the next episode of Gorgeous Drag Panel. So an amazing individual. She's been really excited about getting involved with this and we can't wait to have her as well. So thank you all so much for being here. I'm gonna close the event now. Thanks for being here and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you.